storage. We have a panel with, full of uh, storage guys here. And uh, you know, you can ask anything here, but uh, my, uh, so the first question is, uh, is about uh, the fact that we are seeing a lot of things changing in storage in the last two, three years now. And we, we had this conversation yesterday about some startups that are no longer interesting because they thought, I, I'm not going to mention names, okay? But they, so Flash went so fast in the adoption from, uh, it's an example, it's a technology. So it's so fast now that uh, hybrid systems and uh, other technology based on, uh, on the fact that Flash was really, really expensive. And uh, the time at the beginning, we, we thought about 10 years to have a very viable old Flash system at the $1 per gigabyte uh, level, which is now less than uh, the cost of a physical uh, sorry, hard disk system based. Mm -hmm. now. And uh, so what do you think about uh, this technology advancement? It's so fast, so rapid. Uh, and all these startups, uh, they, 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 it's very hard for them to keep up uh, with, uh, with the technology advancement. And I don't know. It's hard because, because also the, the large vendors, you know, now they have time to react. And I'll jump in. So it's the difference between innovators and the me-toos is really what it comes down to. The, the people that innovate, that do something new and unique and different versus the ones that go, ooh, that's a cool tech. We could probably build a company around that. And they're a couple, three years behind, tend to get left behind. Because by that time, the incumbent traditional vendors have caught up and done the same thing that the innovators have done. And the guys that are the Me Too startups are left, kind of just sitting there, right? They've been overpassed. I think Chris referenced that in his presentation. I think part of that as well is you, um, you have to have a continuous roadmap. Yes. So there's, there's no point coming with one thing and going, we're not like, you know, the flash, some of the, as you mentioned, the flash vendors, you know, coming along and just saying, I've got a flash product. That needs to have an evolution. So some vendors didn't have uh, features in their products. So of course, other people came along and did the, the speed thing, but they delivered the features as well. And I think there's part of the problem with IT. You just have to be continually evolving um, and having a roadmap to know where you're going to keep on, keep on, keep on going. And that's really hard. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. I mean, it, it's quite a challenge for startups, really, isn't it? Because mm. unless they, they go into the market with something great, they develop it. If they catch a niche, they do well initially, but then they're looking, they either have to be bought by somebody, or as you say, they have to develop extra capabilities. Yeah. It's not just enough to have innovation, because you could look at Copan, for example, the made idea was a great idea in concept. Maybe the practicalities were a little bit hard to, to realize. What about the fact that it would, couldn't fit on anybody's floor? Yeah, it was well, so that was heavy. a slightly minor <laughs> yeah. problem. But you then, as you say, you have to have a roadmap of capability beyond that yeah. and to lead into a new niche areas, new innovations, because if you're not doing something ahead of everybody else, you, you'll get consumed by, or oh, surpassed rather, by the big storage vendors, for example. So, Can I say a little word about that? I think that a while ago, it took a long time for storage incumbents to embrace new technology. I'm thinking of Compellent, Equal Logic, 3 path, people like that. They built themselves up and eventually they got acquired. They were all able to operate independently, equal logic with iSCSI, compellent with fiber channel and so forth. There wasn't a great deal of overlap between them. They were all able to do their own thing in what looks like a pretty relaxed kind of way now. The VCs saw these enormously profitable takeouts and acquisitions of these companies and thought, we'll plug money into storage startups. And it happened with the all flash arrays. And there were the early ones with arrows in their back, and then a whole flood of others poured in. And what happened is they got acquired a hell of a lot quicker at an earlier stage than the compellents, the equal logics, and so on. There was more overlap. It was far more difficult to <coughs> differentiate yourself from your others. But as long as there were a lot of acquirers, it didn't matter too much. Oh, they bought so-and-so, said Cisco. We'll buy Whiptail. Yeah. 415 million. Who gives a shit? Um, and then with software-defined storage and all the latest startups, it seems to me the pace of innovation has got quicker, that the reaction time of the incumbents has got faster still. I mean, look at the way EMC's adopted hyperconverged infrastructure with VX Rack and so forth. It is bewildering. If I was in Maxter 
or scale or some of the others, I'll be looking at this and thinking, oh my God. Not only have we got to develop our product, think about getting it to market somehow, build up a channel, do sales and marketing, have different. We've now got to evolve our products I, as well. I would, I would just say one thing on the EMC side though. EMC had two products. The first one failed miserably and then they did it again. If you were a startup and you had one product that failed miserably, you'd be out of business. Copa. No, Evo Rail. So Evo Rail yeah. was their first attempt and it failed miserably. Well, I'm sorry. And then uh, Copan was that. And Copan was like that. It yes. had the time to fail magnificently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but EMC only got away with that because they were a big enough company that they yeah. could fail and try again. Whereas a startup doesn't necessarily get that luxury. And, and also, all these startups now, and they are uh, starting to to build a relationship with large vendors, uh, like, uh, you know, all, all the VSAs are, have now a uh, partnership with Lenovo, no? which is, they, they are one of the many at the end of the day, because Lenovo only wants to sell the, uh, its servers. It's not about the, the features. So you are, you are one of the many potential uh, VSAs on top of Lenovo. Arm. And what the Lenovo guys are is going to do when 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 they are on in front of customers so it, it's really really tough to to have a differentiator so, some way okay that's uh, that's really tough but uh, do, do you see do you see in the in the next i don't know couple of years okay with all these startups and with many of them struggling actually and VC money that uh, is supposed to be limited in the future because uh, the, the, the expectation is not so, so good, okay? So when, when I talk to startups lately, they say, okay, in the next few months, there will be less money, okay? Will they start again to innovate? Or, because I, I saw a lot of money thrown away in, in the last few years from these small startups. Many times. It's a bit like war, isn't it? War and peace. When there's a war on innovation peaks at its highest because there's money going into funding that innovation. Mm. But then equally, the war can't sustain itself forever and there becomes a trough, which is peace, mm. and innovation drops off during that period. And I think that's the same for VC funding. It goes into that kind of wave of, you know, people accelerate money into it because it's delivering. But then when it stops delivering or there's more failures because of the numbers of people, the, the more risks they've taken, they start to slow down that investment. And the macroeconomic climate also has an impact on that capability as well. So I think we do see peaks and troughs, and that affects really the startups that are in where they happen to be at the point in time that that funding also follows. I wonder if there was a certain degree of opportunism as well, because everybody saw that storage was getting, you know, as, as Enrico said, lots of people were selling stuff and, you know, and um, people were being bought out. And I wonder whether a lot of people jumped in and didn't really know what they were they were getting themselves into. So yet another clone of the same technology coming in to the market that wasn't any, any different really from somebody else, but they thought, well, it's got a good chance to be bought up. So they it's moved kind of in. And I wonder whether we'll need to see something more innovative for people to invest in the future, more, more new and creative. Yeah, a bit of the dot-com bubble type of scenario as well. You know, the money that flowed into that was, was silly, basically, because companies were just thinking this was a, a ride for free. So yeah, how, many I, how many different search engines did we have? So I had, a, I had a music company in the dot-com boom, okay? So I set up a company, floated it on the stock market, and um, we went to Dell to get some equipment. And Dell said to us, oh, are you an internet company? And they were like, not really. And they said, oh, not, we can't lend you. We can't lend you the money to buy the service. So we put .com on the end of our name. We went back to them and they went, yep, no problem, and signed it off. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, three years later, we went and did the same thing again. And they said, sorry, we can't lend to you. You're an internet company. <laughs> they completely flipped and just wouldn't. <laughs> they, yeah, yeah. So, we, so yeah. Is it .com off the we went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> business model didn't work. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Oh. You've got the, well, I've got the mic, so got the can mic I just out. do one quick? <laughs> <laughs> Possession, all that. Um, apologies to Grant in advance for asking these questions because you're probably going to want to punch me after it. Um, I think now with what's happening with Dell and EMC, with people like Lenovo coming into the storage market, in the enterprise storage market, with more of the drive manufacturers pushing into the enterprise space with people like Micron, I think we're finally seeing what's been threatened for years, which is the final commoditization of storage. It's been talked about for a long time, but for storage hardware, it's definitely happening. Um, and we're seeing more and more software companies 
coming to market that say we don't really care what the hardware is we sit over. Are we finally seeing the death of the traditional enterprise storage company in your mind? But because of legal obligations, I'm going to stay a mile away from that question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hoping Mr. Meller gives his view on that as well. No. <laughs> but you, you know what? That um, probably banks still have uh, millions of lines of codes written in COBOL. So I don't think that uh, companies that are, are buying uh, VMAX or HDS stuff, uh, they are going to to change their mind tomorrow, okay? Or at least for certain workloads, certain applications. So, but, but it's true, for, for, for many applications, probably for new applications. So we, we saw in a slide now that there is a bank changing many of their databases uh, from Oracle to NoSQL. But uh, it's also because they used the, the, the wrong uh, database to, to build uh, so many applications because they have uh, an enterprise agreement, I don't know. So they, they, they start uh, building application on Oracle because Oracle was there. And now they say, oh, we, we chose the, the, the wrong tool. The same is for anything. No? We, we, in my presentation, I was talking about secondary storage. Yes, if you, if you buy primary storage to do secondary storage, it's expensive. And now secondary storage is growing, capacity is growing, and you have a problem. So you have to rethink that. Of course. So, uh, to, to answer if, if, if PMC didn't have SLDF, people wouldn't have been buying the VMAX for years. Sorry? Uh, if, if PMC didn't have SLDF, people wouldn't have been buying the VMAX for years. Well, well it's, now also, now it's so also, you, you can find... Now, now there's so much power on some of the other stuff around some of the features and speeds and everything. And the That's my point. You don't down. have to buy into Why storage would, here. Yeah, but, so, look, look at this. There are customer migrating to uh, new old flash solutions just because the, um, they are faster, okay? Not, not just because the features, because some customer bought VMAX or whatever because they thought that it was faster than anything else, yeah, and it used okay? To be and years, but the problem was you would end up with a big chunk of iron on the floor and generally you couldn't get full usage out of it. You'd run out of IOPS or you'd run out of something. It, it wouldn't perform. So surely now you would throw the money at something that you know is going to perform. You can turn your back on it and, and just get on with doing other things rather than nursing the... the no, no, no. Mm. So, uh, just, just to answer it. So, uh, <coughs> so, uh, oh, you don't want to stay quiet now. <laughs> no, because I want to talk about it in a different way. So you asked a great question. Who thinks uh, a vendor's revenue stream comes from hardware? Good answer. <laughs> hardware Software. <laughs> you're wrong. Support. You're right. So the point I'm going to make is there is a reason those legacy systems stay around. Fair, but fair. General observation. Gen <laughs> can't even make my point. General observation, right? The reason those systems stay around for so long is because there's a resistance to change in the enterprise. Fair? And if the companies are going to continue to support that legacy architecture by continued engineering and continued parts replacement and all of those things that entail support contracts, right? That, that on the flip side of it turns into one of the biggest revenue streams and they're running a business at the end of the day. Yeah. So it doesn't behoove them sometimes to go out and push the latest and greatest. It does from an engineering effort because that's less legacy code they have to maintain, right? But at the end of the day, they, they still make a lot of money doing it, maintaining those older systems. So to answer, I would say no to answer your direct question that they're going to be around for a long. There's still Z890 mainframes at universities. You know, there's all that stuff is still around. So but it's going to be a while. But there's only one mainframe company. Lenovo? <laughs> <laughs> Unisys. But actually, aren't IBM, Big one. aren't IBM making more revenue to mainframe technology now than they ever did? I heard the other day because they make money out of it. You know, but actually, I mean, to answer your question, I think it is a challenge for traditional storage vendors because they see the market changing. What you have to do, what we're doing, is taking a position on the fact that engineer platforms will still have a requirement for years to come, and that won't change. But it is a slowing market in that respect, and the move is towards uh, commodity, and that's why we're building our capability, which is data management, not storage per se so that you can put it on top of commodity white box hyperscaler platforms. And our revenue will probably shift in that respect in terms of how it does, but we're still delivering the same capabilities from a you know, from data management I think that's a key point, though, is what you just said, Grant. And that's, 
the market's fragmented, so you can't be a one product company. And NetApp was reasonably you know, um, guilty of that for a long, long time. Um, and now you know, there are other choices, and I think you're right, that traditional market isn't growing. It's, it's splitting and other markets are growing. You know, the secondary storage side of things will become a bigger market potentially. Um, and I think there's the problem. You have to have a portfolio of products. If you're just sitting with one product and hoping that's going to run your company, then that's when you're going to have a problem. How will cohesity survive in that case? <laughs> They'll have to come up with other products. <laughs> but that destroys the message. I, I think that's a good question. From what we are seeing uh, in the market, we've got customers out there who are analysing various technologies and if there's a recognition that you'll need a variety of solutions. There isn't going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, uh, there's a guy called David Berman who's the Vice President of Infrastructure at uh, one of our uh, customers in the States and basically they're constantly evaluating converged, hyper-converged, software-defined, you know, they've, and their view is that they will choose the platform that's best suited to each workload rather than take a one-size-fits-all strategy. And I think that that's, that's going to continue. There's, there's problem is there's so much choice now, and the customer doesn't really know which, which way to turn. Um, and it's making sense of, of all of this. And I suppose that's why these events like this are useful, to kind of try and separate the hype from reality. So I think it's... And we can show you we're confused as everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have the microphone? Oh, yeah, at the back. Here, yeah, okay. Um, you spoke a lot about the, the supply side, so big companies, startups, continuous roadmap. What about the demand side? Customers are getting confused, so many options, so many alternatives. They don't know how to pick a new solution. They're two years behind, you know, we have this uh, flashy new product, but they are still thinking in the fiber channel. So. What about the demand side? Um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because um, organizations like not to change because change is risk. And risk means that you could be putting your business at risk. You know, so there has to be enough of a difference for you to make that change. So you're going to have to look at it and go, yeah, this is half or a third of the price, or we can do something we never could do previously. Um, and that, I think, is a challenge for companies like yourself. You have to come out and be, yeah, be creative. All the vendors, if you look at it from, or most of them, uh, from a very high perspective, they more or less have the same pitch. Reduce TCO at 70%, it's all flash, <coughs> software defined, uh, you know. Maybe that's why we ended up with influencers then, because, you know, somebody's got to cut through the... Um, <laughs> I was trying to think of the, the, the most polite word bearing in mind who got vendors on. Um, you know, you, you, somehow you've got to cut through it. And I think that's the hard bit, isn't it? How do you... How do you look at the messages and think, yeah, that's just not true, or that's being slightly you know, stressed. And that's a hard thing for end users to deal with. And I think a lot of them don't do it. They just stay with what they used to because it's, um, it's easier. I think a lot comes down to how the organization's management changes over time. So CIOs coming in with a two-year mandate to change an organization. And they bring what they've done before, and it may have been successful or not, but they're only there for two years, and then move on to the next thing. So what you tend to find is they come into a company, and cloud is the prime example of that, and they say, now we've got a cloud strategy, we're going to go in and develop that. And then two years later, they're gone. The organization, of course, has still got to try and deliver on that. But that's how I think legacy ends up changing, because the management above changes, and they bring in different ideas. The organization itself is always slower by it naturally to change. It takes a change in management, I think, sometimes to do that. Okay. One of the other things I always like to bring up as well is that not only is the industry changing, not only are the products changing, the people that are running this stuff in the enterprise are changing. The next generation of admins are moving in. And I think I was having this conversation at over beers last night, but uh, in another maybe 10 years, the admin that is going to be running the data centers is not going to know life before smartphones. <laughs> They're going to want that push button tap where it just pulls in an app and it does something, right? So the kinds of infrastructure and stuff that we're putting in and developing, I'm, you laugh, I'm serious. But that stuff's going to happen. You heard it here first, right? Well, it's already happening. We, we, we will have a lot of uh, AIs telling us what to do with our infrastructure. So, uh, so what I was, was it? very scared. A few months ago, we had the, uh, a meeting at, uh, at uh, Tech Field Day. And and the guys are, oh, we have a robot and it does everything for you. So what's my job then? No? <laughs> because because if the, everything is automated at a level that uh, you don't need 
you, you have to trust the, the system and then you so again the storage admin is that because because there is something that is going to do our job better than us one one thing i would say is that um, i was working with ibm some time ago and i used to work for ibm and the job title you had was your storage engineer and the job titles were changed to the cloud so i made this so they're not storage engineers, they're cloud engineers. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the difference. And so I was talking earlier about Shell having this <coughs> strategy that by 2025, they're going to migrate all the business to the cloud. But that's quite a long way out. And you know, how far ahead do we look? If you talk about CIOs having two-year views of the world and then they're moving on, and then you've got organizations like Shell saying, we're planning for 2025, but who knows what technology we're going to have by then. But, we're just taking the same technology and wrapping it under different terminology in some respects. You know, we're still going to have to manage it. We're still going to have to be someone overseeing it, an architect, and it. that's not going to change. Do you have a question? One of the daftest things about the whole storage industry over the years has been the simple thing of the protocol, that from fiber channel to iSCSI to NFS had this daft choice, even in a, say, a VMware environment, that you had to choose between these kind of things. Is the future an object storage, S3-like thing for everything, or are we still going to be messing around with uh, fiber channel over token ring? God, I hope so. Kind of things in the future. <laughs> I'm so tired of having that conversation. Because at the end of the day, it's what are your admins most skilled at? Are, do they like prov provisioning WWNs or do they like doing IQNs with iSCSI? If it's both over Ethernet or all over fiber channel, the medium is more important than the protocol you're using, in my opinion. But is that going to evolve now to S3 or something? Because, yeah. Personally, I think, off. I don't know if it'll be S3. We thought it was going to be HDFS for a while. Now S3 has come on really strong. Who, if S3 is the end-all, be-all, who knows? I personally think Ethernet is here to stay. Uh, NAS for life. That's uh, you know, but at the end of the day, I think fiber channels just made itself <laughs> too complicated um, to continue to be as simple as some of the things you can do with Ethernet. One hundred percent, I'll say fiber channel and possibly even iSCSI is 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 out the water. But Ethernet will be the standard. But what will be the access protocol? Uh, you're going to have files, billions of files, virtual machines, containers cat pictures, the whole lots, are you going to have a different protocol but for you each? Have Ethernet, you have TCP IP, and on top of that, you have high-level protocols. Yeah, what's... It could what's be NFS, it could be... S3, that's what I'm saying. Are we, gonna, are we going to converge like, around NFS yeah, I mean, or S3? You can converge. One solution for everything, yeah, that, that, that's the problem. It's, you, you can have a, a Do you think we'll ever do. evolve to one of these sort of protocols? There will have to be wide area... Uh, sorry, wide area, wide area network aware protocols. So you, you're all aware of the limitations of TCP IP... Um, when you look at the use of Azure and the SMB3 protocol, you would never have considered using SMB2 over a WAN. But <laughs> exactly. So I think more protocols are going to be um, developed uh, and matured to become WAN aware, if you like, because of the, the distances that we'll, the, the data will have to travel around, around the place. And so I think that isn't going to change. It's just going to be a, a maturing and awareness in the protocols. I think there's no reason why you couldn't do it, <clears throat> um, but you've got two different requirements, I think. You know, if you look at, say, the block protocols, you want to access very small quantities of, of something, and you need to do it very quickly. So how would you do that with an object or even a file system? Would you allow sub-object I.O. to be able to do that? If you could do that, well, then a LUN could just be an object. There's no reason why not. You know, you could actually just encapsulate that in, in that process. But you still need to be able to sometimes write to sub-components of things. And unless you have that built into the object protocol, you can't do it. And then I guess one of the other things is that you'd, you'd still need to sit there underneath that as well and think about how you actually access that data. But this, uh, again, is complicating simple stuff. Well, so, uh, yeah, well yes and no, because, you know, why, why wouldn't we just... Yeah, the sub-object uh, implementation. You already have block, as you said. Yeah. Why, why, why are you reinventing the wheel? Isn't it, isn't it a bit like saying, Cars or trucks, and we can just have one vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I just finish one bit off on that? Okay. You just probably, one. You probably just could go forward. Just finish one little thing off on that. I think one of the things we do have as a problem is that the actual current protocols, like the way Fiber Channel and SCSI work, are horrendous. That we, there were some, there were some real opportunities missed 
when they designed SCSI compared to, sorry, the in-frame protocols like channel command words and so on, where we actually encapsulated things like data about the transit of the, of the I.O. up and down and, and where it was at each stage so we could see what was going on. If we'd had things like that in there, things like Fiber Channel and, ISC and SCSI would have been an awful lot better than they are today. So, you know, we, we missed an opportunity, unfortunately, the way we designed it. I don't think you'll ever see the disappearance of lots of protocols. And like VHS and beta, you know, where they managed to get rid of one of them and stay gotten rid of, it's never going to be the same with storage because of the fact that you've got different types of requirements for access. You've potentially got storage in memory with storage class memory and other things coming along. So how do you deal with that? It's probably a new protocol popping out to do that. It's always going to be evolving, and therefore you have to support both what's coming out anew because of the requirements, but also the tail of legacy because of the fact that the one thing that does stay around forever is pretty much data and, you know, it takes a long time to change protocol access on that sometimes. Okay. Weren't block protocols originally designed to support uh, database-oriented systems rather than file-oriented systems? Yeah. Uh, yes. If yeah. you think about a block protocol, was an extremely efficient way to place a one or a zero in response to a transactional environment, and that will not go away. So we're talking about we're crossing platforms to do a lot of things. I realize that everybody's in the clouds or whatever. <laughs> that sounds creepy. <laughs> Is that a real thing? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So I had a que I had a question for that I'd like, and I'll answer last conveniently. But I'm curious, starting with you, Enrico, and coming down the line, what do you guys? I mean, to wrap this up for everybody, what do you guys think the biggest game-changing thing for storage is going to be next? Not five years from now, but more immediate than that. So I, I thought about uh, object storage for many years. Uh, I'm I'm. I'm seeing now that uh, object storage vendors are finally understanding that uh, you need an ecosystem to build, uh, to build something for new applications, okay? not just APIs. And I think that if, if they get that right, we will finally have a, a primary storage block accessed and a secondary storage for all the rest. And finally, I think it, it, it's going to change how enterprises are are, are going to buy storage. Cool. My Chris? vote goes for NVMe over fabrics because it will just kill storage and storage area network and fiber access latency. I would say the ability to have mobility to the data because as we move from physical servers that never moved to VMs that became a little bit movable to containers that are now going to be completely flexible in any way you like and be located anywhere. Um, the problem we've got is data's got the inertia and doesn't go necessarily with that object as easily as we'd like it. And I think either we, whether we're spoofing that, whether we're caching it, or whatever technique we're using, it's the ability to say that the latency problem doesn't exist. I'm not saying anybody's got the, that solved yet, but that's the one I would hope that we could fix. Oh, sorry. For me, it would be an expansion of what I was saying earlier about reducing the need for your storage devices and the data to be so near to each other. When you think about when you architect a lot of solutions today, you're still worrying in a lot of cases about how near everything is to each other and being able to have uh, protocols and technologies that allow you to have them further apart and, and not have that impact latency. I mean, previously I worked um, in a WAN acceleration company where I spent a lot of time doing UDP versus TCP to eliminate latency from the link. Well, it's kind of building that concept, if you like, um, deeper into the storage protocols themselves, so we eliminate geography as a barrier to doing business. 
so five years out, that's a difficult one, but I think I kind of agree with the combination. So I think uh, object over the next few years is going to rapidly accelerate. It's now the time that object's wow. going to get big. So no doubt about that. <laughs> <We're just saying. laughs> but I was going to say at the end. But, Chris, <laughs> but Chris's idea of NVMe, et cetera, is going to take off rapidly as well. And what so, that will do to how data is, how it's delivered and where is it stored is going to give us a big challenge, a data management challenge that's going to extend not just across the external arrays that are storing the data, whether it's object or otherwise, but actually into the servers because they will have terabytes of persistent memory going forwards. And that's going to create a real challenge for how you manage and uh, you know, deal with the data. So I think it's both of those. Five years. And oh, we have to maybe. wrap up. And now you need to answer. I ate one. So I love the NVMe answer because that's, I love that one. I think that one's going to go well also, but to be unique, um, I think the introduction of 16 and 32 terabyte SSDs is probably going to be really game changing for a lot of enterprises. 3D VNAND, I guess, is what I'll, I'll go deeper than, than that. I'll, I'll go down to a medium and just say 3D VNAND. Because uh, Samsung announced last uh, Flash Memory Summit, they're a year ahead of schedule. We're going to have 16 terabytes by the end of this year if they're not out, out being tested already. 32 terabyte, two and a half inch drives. Imagine what your capacities are going to be like in very dense platforms now and what you're going to be able to do with that. Now Flash isn't a performance play. Now it's a capacity play because it has surpassed what's possible on the current spinning disk that's out there. So now you get to rethink all of that. And oh, by the way, the performance is just icing on the cake for big uh, object storage, secondary storage implementations, right? That to me is really going to just twist the knob on what you're going to be able to do with just raw capacity in that respect. So keep an eye out for that one.